The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So, okay, well, welcome, and I'm really happy to be here at SELF for the first time. I've wanted to come since, I don't know, I met Dave five years ago or six years ago at the Ohio Linux Fest, and we had a chat then about his idea to have SELF. So I've been uh, wanting to come for years, and this is the first opportunity I've had. I'm uh, from right in the middle of the United States, so it's not conveniently located for me. Today's talk uh, is a little bit odd. Uh, and it's about cats, as you now know. Uh, before we talk about cats, though, I want to have a, a brief interlude where we talk a little bit about dogs. And I'm here, as a way of introducing myself, I'm here with the Fedora Project, and we're celebrating the recent release of Fedora 17, which is the beefy miracle release. So if you come by the Fedora booth, which is just outside these doors, uh, you'll see a gigantic six-foot-tall hot dog and a bunch of crazy people. Uh, please stop by and uh, visit with the Fedora folks. Uh, find out about the Beefy Miracle. Take your picture with a gigantic hot dog. How many chances do you get to go home with a picture with a six-foot hot dog? Uh, a couple of other sort of brief announcements. One, you should have gotten a card like this in your bag. If you didn't, you don't need the card. Uh, but across the street at Marshall Park, starting at 12.30 today, there'll be a dog cart uh, and a bunch of crazy fedora people. And we'll have, uh, you know, well, we're going to break a rule that there's no free lunches. There are free lunches today. Come over, have some hot dogs with us. Uh, it'll start at 12.30 and go until we're out of hot dogs. And we have hundreds of them, so uh, get there early, avoid the lines. The other thing I wanted to mention briefly was that uh, open source communities and Fedora being one of them are particularly interested in uh, community aspects of things and giving back to communities. Uh, we do that all the time in open source. And in Charlotte, we're going to try to give something back to the community of Charlotte for hosting this event. Uh, so we have a food drive, the Beefy Miracle food drive. And next to Beefy out in the, uh, in the hall will be a gigantic bin uh, to collect food for the loaves and fishes food pantry here in Charlotte. So if you have a chance, if you heard about it in advance, please, uh, please drop off some food to help people here in Charlotte. If you didn't have a chance or didn't hear about it, and it's not convenient to go grab some food, uh, you can make another kind of contribution if you're so inclined. Uh, as, a, as a gift back to you for doing that, you'll receive one of these Beefy Miracle buttons. They're extremely rare. Very few people have these. So it'll be a collectible. You'll see them on eBay in a couple of years. Okay, enough about hot dogs. Uh, so now we'll get into the talk about demogification, back to cats. Uh, you've already seen the slide for the brief history of demogification, so I don't know if I need to talk about it anymore. Uh, but back in the 1990s, and it actually started happening much earlier than the 1990s, but in the 1990s, uh, Merlin on Usenet News uh, in CompUnix Shell uh, started awarding a prize for the useless use of cat. And what happened, how many people remember Usenet? Does anybody still use Usenet? <laughs> a few people. Uh, well, this was a, I don't know, I think of it as the social media of 20 years ago. Uh, we used to hang out in places on Usenet and discuss various things about, uh, well, everything you could imagine. So it was, a, it was a wide open, free-for-all sort of media. 
people who wrote shell programs, uh, or even just were learning how to just navigate a, sh a Unix shell, often visited Comp Unix shell and helped each other. So it's just like a forum today where people get together or an IRC uh, to help people with their problems. And one of the things that uh, Merlin noticed was that people kept telling other people to do, they kept using examples uh, of something that annoyed him. Uh, it was really quite a harmless thing, but it was still annoying to him. And it was annoying to a lot of other people. Uh, we'll talk about exactly what a useless use of cat is next. Uh, but this spawned uh, sort of a later enterprise of people who tried to go around the internet removing useless uses of cat. And that process is called demogification. For this talk, we can uh, you know, get through how to deal with a useless use of cat in two minutes. So we're really going to be demogifying useless uses of a lot of other things as well. So, so here's the classic example of a useless use of cat. Uh, we cat some file and we pipe that into another program and it does something with it. Uh, the, the file name doesn't really matter and what the filter is on the other side of the pipe doesn't really matter, uh, although it could in theory. Um, so the construct that kind of tips us off that something's fishy here is cat, file name, pipe, and then some more stuff. And what I kind of like to do is uh, have, have sort of a visual image. We want to recognize that pattern so that we can rewrite it in a more suitable way later. And so when I see that, what I might see in my mind is this, which isn't coming out very good. Uh, but that's, that's a vicious cat uh, doing nasty things to a penguin. Uh, we're going to put an end to that at the end of this talk. So a demogified version, here are two demogified versions of this uh, sort of classic case. Uh, one, you just let the filter read the file directly, which almost all of them do. Uh, the other is, rather than, rather than using cat in a pipe, you just redirect the input from the file uh, into the standard input of the filter. Okay, so we'd be done now if we just wanted to get rid of cats. But there's lots of other useless stuff that we see over and over and over in shell scripts and in shell programming. So we want to get rid of as much of that as we can too, or at least today, just a little bit. So I'm gonna talk about kind of five features in Bash that uh, allow us to do some things in different ways that clean up scripts and stop annoying people like Merlin and me and a lot of others. Uh, one thing to note about this talk is that it's not, uh, it's not about portable shell scripting, right? I don't, if you have to write portable shell scripts, you have to take a lot of other things into account and they're actually peculiar to the things you're porting to. So we don't care about portable shell scripting today. We're just talking about features that are in bash. They happen to overlap with some other shells as well. So here's one feature of bash that I almost never see used by anyone, but it's a very nice feature. Uh, they're called here strings. Uh, almost everybody who's written shell programs uh, in the last 30 years uh, is familiar with here documents, which are kind of an inline uh, file that you stick into your shell script that you can redirect into another program. A here string is something that's uh, been made available more recently, uh, and it's kind of a sort of a midget version of a here document. So it's just uh, this triple redirection operator which is uh, uh, on the left you have a command and what you're redirecting into it is the output of the string. And when I say output of a string, uh, this does expand the string before it passes it on standard input to the command. Yeah, so if you have dollar sign shell as part of this string, you probably get bin bash passed through.
So here's a useless use of echo. Echo is not a very offensive command because it's built in, but it's still useless to echo string into pipe uh, and then pass that to standard input of a program that could take a, a here string as an argument instead. So here I'm just wanting to do a little bit of real arithmetic, so I, I echo something into uh, BC. The demogified version, which is now off our screen, is there anybody here that can adjust this? Wrong one, yeah, it's the one back there. Well, it just got worse. Okay, well, the demogified version is uh, BC, then the triple redirection operator, and then just the contents of the string that I had before. And if you can't read that at the bottom. This is gonna get worse on a slide later, but we'll wing it. So a second group of uh, special redirections that's really very useful uh, and also almost never used by programmers is uh, redirecting to slash dev slash TCP or UDP slash host slash port. And what this allows us to do is open sockets to other places uh, directly from the shell. I will mention that uh, there are some, this is a compile time option to bash, and so not all versions of bash that you run into will, will have this enabled. As far as I know, Debian, which has a 10-year-old bug filed against it for not enabling this, is the only distribution I'm aware of that doesn't have it enabled. Uh, and there are similar features to this in corn, modern corn shells, uh, and even in awk, uh, you can open sockets directly. So what happens here is you can, for the syntax, dev TCP or dev UDP, those things don't really exist in the file system. It's just that the shell recognizes when it sees it, this is, this is something special, and the shell's being requested to open a socket. So it goes and tries to do that. Um, the host name can either be a host name or an IP address, and the port can either be a, a, a port number or a service name. So there's a lot of flexibility, although if you use a service name instead of a port, then it depends on what you have in Etsy services, whether or not things are gonna work the way you expect. Uh, if you use an IP number versus uh, a host name, uh, we'll see that that can make a difference in terms of uh, whether this succeeds or fails, depending upon whether DNS is working on your system or not. Um, so what happens when Bash sees this redirection is it tries to open a socket uh, using either TCP or UDP to whatever that host is on whatever port you've requested. A couple of places where we often do networking kind of related stuff in shell scripts are we might use ping to just ping someplace and see if we can reach it, see if it's live, see if it's answering. Uh, we often sometimes see netcat used to check for something more particular, like is there an Apache server running on port 80 somewhere? Um, so we're not gonna go to useless uses of netcat, although you could substitute ping in here as well. Um, here's a, a this is more often you would see this uh, netcat command embedded inside an if test. 
So if this works, then you do something. If it doesn't, you might take remedial action. Um, so we're going to do sort of a, a quiet netcat, just a scan. We're not going to send any data to, to the floraproject.org on port 80. We're just checking to see whether we can open a connection to it, whether something's on the other end. Uh, we get back a zero if that works, and we get back a one if it doesn't work. Now, for another sort of visual reminder of uh, this sort of situation, uh, this guy really comes out bad in this resolution. Uh, well, this is a cat sitting on top of a computer, a network savvy cat uh, with evil intentions, which are clear in his eyes if you can see his eyes. So here's a demogified version of this. Um, there's a few things interesting about this and unusual and kind of confusing at first. Uh, one is there isn't actually any command here. There's just two redirections. Uh, the first redirection doesn't really matter uh, unless you, you know, if you don't care about seeing uh, a little bit of uh, information about what was attempted printed out on the screen. Um, so one thing that's a little unusual is that we redirect dev null before the other redirection. And in normal, with normal redirection, if you redirect uh, standard error to dev null and standard output to some other file, it normally doesn't matter which order you do that in. And most people do it, redirect standard out, then redirect standard error. Here it does make a difference because this thing is not a normal file redirection. So when, when this redirection gets processed, it, it may output some stuff. So you want to redirect standard error first. And the other weird thing is there's no program on this line. It's just it tries to open this. And when bash sees dev TCP, it says, OK, I'm going to go look this thing up if it's a host name, see what the IP is, uh, try to open a TCP connection to the socket on that host. And if that works, it returns zero. And if it fails, as in this case, it returns a one. Now again, more often, something like this would be embedded also in an if test or, or something. So you could react one way or another if it, uh, if it succeeds. Now this is a kind of. Uh, a, a clever, simple way to just test is something answering somewhere. Uh, you can do all sorts of socket programming directly in Bash using this construct. So I, I'm not going to talk much about that, but I do want to give you just one quick example of how you might do something a bit more complicated. And this isn't complicated at all. Uh, but the first, it's like four lines. And the first line and the last line basically open the socket connect it to a file descriptor, and the last line closes the socket uh, and closes the file descriptor. So we're going to open file descriptor 3 for reading and writing uh, to the FTP port at kernel.org. Um, all I'm doing is sending a quit to that file descriptor, and then I read whatever came back. So I find out that they're running VSFTPD 2.3.4. Now, I think you could probably imagine just from this very little tiny example of how you might use this to do various things with mail servers or other things. So a lot of power here to uh, directly manipulate socket connections in Bash. Next up is Brace Expansion. And brace expansion is something that it, it seems like almost everybody learns how to use it this way. And while we might learn how to use it another way, we either forget or didn't learn it. Um, so this is just kind of commonly, you know, people know how to expand strings so that they can do like one make dir command and create five directories with one simple command. Um, or you can expand things so you have a, just a little string that expands into a, a bunch of different words. 
Less commonly, brace expansion is used for expanding sequences of numbers. And this is, this is a, a pretty powerful way to use it, but it does have a limitation that's unfortunate. But here, there are, well, you see three examples, but there are really four examples here. So the first one just shows how to uh, generate a number sequence from one to 10, and then you can go the other direction from nine back down to one. So the order that you, uh, the order that you have these two arguments be, uh, around the dots indicates whether you're going up or down through the sequence. Uh, in the second case, we have a, a lead zero is the only thing that's notable about it, and that causes the sequence to be padded so that everything's the same length, so there's zero padding. Uh, for people who are familiar with the sequence command, it does all these things with um, arguments. The third one has a, a third option where you have a, a third number on the end, and that's a step number. So it'll expand the sequence, but only in this case, print every third one. Um, the missing example is similar to this first one, but it doesn't have a space here. And when you have them uh, connected, it expands them both at once. And so you get a, a much more complicated expansion. So if we did this, Without this space, what we would get is a one from there, and then nine down through one. So we'd get, one, we'd get 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. After we got down to 11, it would go over there and get the two again, and then go through this whole expansion again. So we get 29, 28, 27. So. And if you do it with more than two things concatenated, you're, you're really, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Um, the question was, can it do letters? And I'm actually not sure. Somebody test it right now. The answer is yes. C shell can. So C shell can. <laughs> okay, that's that's great. So you can do a dot dot f. Okay. So yes. Okay, so where can we use this? Well, one of the things I learned very early on was that in for, in you, when I read a for statement, you can just make a list, and it'll iterate through that list. And sometimes all you want is to know how many times you're iterating. You're not iterating over Bob, Carol, Ted, and Alice or something. So you can just list them. And you also very quickly learn that that doesn't scale very well if you want to have a lot of things that you're iterating over. And that's where people find uh, the sequence command normally. And this is a, well, a way to change the six to 600 and have it still work without having to do a lot of typing. Um, one thing I'll mention here is that a lot of the examples, in fact, all of the examples we've looked at, so, uh, yeah, well, almost all of the examples we've looked at so far, the, the offending bit has been uh, some program, some external program piped into something else. Uh, this is another common kind of place where we see things that can be demogified. When you have uh, a construct like a loop and then inside of it you have back ticks call, you know, invoking a, a separate command. And in this case, I'm sure no one's going to be surprised that we can demogify this using brace expansion. Um, <clears throat> generally cleaner, easier to read, doesn't require external programs to be available. Um, no reason not to use it. The one, the one sort of thing that's annoying about it to me is that uh, in, inside of brace expansion, there is no parameter expansion. So things like trying to do this where instead of one, you have dollar sign low, and instead of six, you have dollar sign high, uh, those variables won't be expanded unless you do an eval. Okay, well, we've talked a little bit about parameters, so let's talk a little bit about parameter expansion. Um, there are three, three kinds, there, there are many other kinds. Oh, this is really unfortunate. 
there are many other kinds of parameter expansion, but uh, three kinds that are uh, especially useful, uh, at least in my world, are prefix matching, suffix matching, and pattern substitution. Uh, with prefix matching, uh, what happens is you have a pattern after the, you, you have to have the curly braces, which is a little annoying, <laughs> so you have a dollar sign curly braces, the name of the variable, and then either a hash or a double hash followed by a pattern and a closed curly brace. Um, in all of these cases, the pat pattern is going to be somewhat limited because uh, this is path name expansion that's allowed here. So it's not full extended regular expressions, right? Um, but generally, what you're doing is taking a, a string and you're just, if you're using this, so you're just trying to hack off something from the end of it or something from the beginning of it, and path name expansion actually is quite adequate to do that. Um, for the, the syntax and stuff for matching suffixes or prefixes is identical except that we use percents instead of hashes. And how, well, I mentioned once to somebody else that I didn't remember, uh, I couldn't ever remember which was which. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're the second person who's told me that it's really simple to remember which is which and, and for years, I'll admit for years, I just pick one because I don't remember. And then I, if I get the wrong end of the string or it doesn't work right, I switch to the other one. So, but yeah. So you can either think of it as the uh, pound sign is to the left of the percent sign on the keyboard. So it takes the left side of the string and this one takes the right side of the string off. Uh, whether you have one or two uh, makes a difference as well, and if you have one, it matches the shortest pattern that matches, and if you have two, it matches the longest pattern that matches. Uh, similarly below. The, I wish I had a chalkboard to write on now, but um, the last one, pattern substitution, is uh, very similar to SED's uh, substitution command. So uh, very often you'll see that it can be used instead of using said. Uh, the syntax is dollar sign, bracket, parameter, slash pattern, slash string, close bracket. Um, and so the idea with it is uh, you look in the pattern, you look in the parameter to match the pattern, and when you get a match, you substitute the string for what got matched. So we have, uh, I think, three examples to look at quickly here. I very often see base name used in scripts, especially with dollar sign zero, to determine just the name of the program itself. And uh, so you'll see something like program name equals back tick, base name, dollar sign zero, back tick. And the demodified version of that is saying program name equals dollar sign zero, uh, hash, hash, star, slash. Right. Though we don't need to spawn subshells, we don't need to call external programs. It's actually even, uh, there's, there's actually a difference there. If you are executing a program that happens to be in a path that has spaces and dashes and so forth in it, you can actually break that out of base name with weird errors like, you know, uh, some argument doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, the, there is, I'll mention also that the demogified version is not exactly the same as base name. So in normal cases, it would work the same as you would expect base name to work, but the edge cases aren't the same. Uh, that normally doesn't matter to anybody. So we can do something similar going the other direction. So for doing uh, dir name, uh, in this case, I want to take off, well, the shortest string that, ma that starts with a slash. I don't really care what's after it. In the previous one, I took off the longest string that ended in a slash. These look a little strange to people when they first start looking at them, but w once you understand how the pattern bit works, uh, it becomes quite intuitive. The 
there are a million ways to remember this. But I think this proves that I was not abnormal not being able to remember it. Uh, okay, so uh, the last example in this section uh, deals with uh, a useless use of set, although it could be a useless use of TR or something else. Uh, what we have, uh, often in, in a shell script, you'll get a variable that has a list of stuff in it. And the list of stuff normally is going to be separated by a space. Uh, very often when we print that out or we save it to a file, we want that list to be separated by colons or semicolons or commas or something else uh, other than a space. So, so here's an example that shows how I most often see that done. Um, I'll mention just as a digression, this top part isn't really part of the talk, but it's uh, just a way to get a list into a variable for us to use. Um, but this, this thing might look weird to uh, some people. And that's another, another strange shell expansion. Uh, if you have a dollar sign bracket exclamation point followed by a pattern, uh, what the shell is going to do is expand that to be uh, all the environment variable names that match the pattern. So that was just an easy way for me to get a short list of something <laughs> to work with here. Uh, so the common solution is to echo that variable into either sed or tr. I'm going to use sed because it kind of uh, matches structurally how we're going to demogify it. Uh, so we do a substitute command and just replace the spaces with commas. And we do that globally. Demogified version. Uh, the top part's identical. The bottom part is uh, a lot shorter. We can notice that. Uh, it doesn't quite look right because there's more slashes than we had before. Uh, the structure of, of the substitution is going to be, uh, you're going to look at this variable, which has got this stuff in it. And then there's supposed to be a, a pattern in here, followed by a slash, followed by a string to substitute. So the string here is the comma. I get that much. <laughs> and the variable name, I get, I get that much. But I have an extra slash before the space. And that's just a, a funny syntactical thing. The space is actually the pattern. And the slash is a, a special symbol. So if the pattern starts with a slash, then it it matches all occurrences that it can find. So it's like the G at the end of the sed command. Uh, but it can be a little bit confusing when you look at it and see extra slashes. Uh, I'll just mention as, a, as an aside that if you want to chop off the end of a string, uh, you can also just leave off the last slash and the string to delete a hunk. And that, that doesn't necessarily delete the end of the string. It deletes the part that was matched anywhere in the string. OK, we have one more, one more idea to look at where we can demogify a little bit of other stuff. Uh, Bash has some match operators. And I'm not really going to talk about these first two, except to say that most people use these as if they weren't match operators. Most people use them to just test for equality or inequality in scripts. But the thing on the right of these uh, is actually a pattern. If you just have a string there, it's going to match for like an exact match. But you could have a string followed by a star, for instance. And then it would match things that match that prefix. So, so those are a little bit more powerful than most people make them out to be. Uh, those are also restricted to a limited kind of pattern matching. But this one, which is very lightly used in programs that I see anyway, uh, does full extended regular expression matching. So it's, it's a very powerful one. Uh, so equals followed by a twiddle lets you match arbitrary regular expressions. So here's an, a, an example of, well, I have some variable. I'm calling it distro. It's got some distro name in it. 
and uh, I'm going to try to, I want to do something special if it's Debian, Ubuntu, or Mint. Uh, since I'm from the Fedora project, I'm going to be polite and not say what we do something. Yeah. We're going to do something, but I'm not going to say what it is. I'm sorry, say that again. Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah, I've, I've, been, opt I've been optimized. <laughs> Is that a case of demogrifying the uh, speaker? <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, sure. There are other ways to construct this regular expression, and some might be better. So, okay, so, yeah. Now, I thought I was going to be polite and not say what we're going to do if we find one of these things, but, but we need to do something special. That's all we need to know. Uh, common ways I see things like this done in scripts, uh, one is like this which works, works fine, but is uh, a little bit awkward and repetitive. Uh, another way I see it done frequently is uh, this, which is, I, I find, more awkward. Uh, and often I see it with the match here on separate lines, so it is even more awkward. Uh, if, if, if you're going to do different cases, if you're going to actually have different cases, using a case statement seems to make sense in my brain. But if all you want to do is, if it's one of these things, do something, then a case statement doesn't really seem to be the right solution. So my suggestion for uh, a nice way to do this, uh, and well, those other two things do demogify it, right? They get rid of the grab. Uh, a nicer way to do this is this way, where we have a single if statement. Uh, it reads very natural to me, and if, if, you're, if your instinct was to solve this using grep, with this regular expression or another regular expression, right? Doing the same thing here is very natural for you because this already made sense to you. Um, okay. I think, are there any questions? I'm not sure what time we're supposed to be finishing up. Okay, well, let me, let me thank you all for coming and uh, being nice to me. Uh, I want to thank the self people for being nice to me. They've been very nice to me. Please remember to come help out uh, the folks in Charlotte uh, at our food drive. And I'll just leave you with one last uh, picture to kind of remember that this is what we're trying to stamp out. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, that's, it's, a little, it's a little bit of a mystery where that came from. Uh, my understanding is that uh, in Britain, the, I don't know if I should have this actually filmed. Uh, Margaret, it, it was derived from the name Margaret. Uh, Maggie, Moggy, got changed into Moggy. And uh, there was a little bit of a mm, catty, sort of nature to that, so uh, is that enough? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so I, I think like a, a, well, I'll let the Brits explain it. Uh, it, it so it came from British slang and a, a group of hackers who like get annoyed by useless uses of cat, coined that term uh, to be uh, the process of removing them.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra's. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astris, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people 
uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack.